dann wird den Juden das Brechen Lügen mal gestoppt werden. We should go and burn all the copies of their Talmud. But he was in, in, infuriated about the Talmud. Of course, today, the Jews consider him a great anti-Semite. Okay, I'm going to show you a little bit of the Marching Design propaganda film here where they talk about C.I. Schofield. Let's watch this. You know, back before the late 1800s, everybody recognized what we're talking about now. Mm -hmm. But something began to change. First with Dr. Uh, you know, Cyrus Schofield. C.I. Schofield was a divorced man. He had trouble with alcohol. He was a lawyer turned preacher. He left his first wife, Leontine Sierre, in 1883. That's the year after he wrote his first book, Rightly Dividing the Word of Truth. So in 1882, he writes his first book, Rightly Dividing the Word of Truth. 1883, he leaves his first wife, marries another lady, and then becomes a pastor in Texas. Very famous, very popular. Okay, let me just pause it there for a minute. Now what these lying, stinking hypocrites do is they mix things from his lost life, Schofield's lost life, and then after he got saved. They'll say, oh, he was crooked lawyer and he was a drunk and everything else. Yeah, before he got saved. Since when do you bring up things from somebody's lost life and judge them for that and try to try to destroy their character as a Christian because of what they did in their past lost life? And this thing of, oh, well, uh, you know, he divorced his first wife. No, she filed for divorce, okay? Because she was a Catholic, a Roman Catholic that didn't want anything to do with salvation, all right. And and you say, well, what but he he should have stayed with her. Oh, he should have stayed with her. Well, why don't you read in your Bible 1 Corinthians chapter 7 sometime? We'll turn there very quickly. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Says here talking about in verse 14. Uh, unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband else were your children unclean but now are they holy but if the unbelieving depart let him depart a brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases but God hath called us to peace if you get saved after you've uh, been married and the person that you're married to doesn't want to convert to, to being a Christian and they're making your life miserable you have every right to leave them you do you're not under bondage in such cases, according to Scripture, all right? Not according to a bunch of these little Andersnake goons here, all right? Let's just keep watching here. I'm going to show you where they're getting this information from. Schofield's dispensational premillennial Bible was edited with financial assistance from prominent businessmen, some of which had questionable religious ties. And he had Jewish retainers who made him a member of a club called the Lotus Club, mm -hmm. a, a sort of a secret society. And suddenly he had plenty of money. This corrupt lawyer who had abandoned his wife and was found guilty of numerous offenses as, as a corrupt attorney. But Schofield was given money and the Oxford group out of England published his Bible. Why would they take a crooked lawyer and make him the editor of a Bible? And then suddenly they had millions of dollars to promote it. With that amount of money, then the Bible took off and it it basically sealed the deal for the Jews. Okay. Tex Mars, you are such a stinking liar. You you are disgusting. Man, he, oh, he's a crooked lawyer. He's a crooked... That was before he got saved. All right? These people, they're so disgusting. But I remember hearing this thing with Tex Mars years and years ago, and he had this whole thing on Joseph Canfield. He wrote a book, Joseph M. Canfield, called uh, The Incredible Schofield and His Book. And I'm going to show you here this article. I'm going to actually I printed it out right from the website here, uh, eaec.org. Okay, right there, a biographical, a short biographical sketch, okay, about this Joseph M. Canfield guy. And I printed it out because a lot of times I give links and then the links get changed and then it's like, oh, there's no link here. So right here it is. I'm going to show you this article. Here we have it. There's the address if you want that. 
Joseph M. Canfield. We're not going to read this whole thing. You can read it. Just gets into some of his uh, past and things here. He was raised by a fun or in a fundamental Baptist church in Philadelphia. That's where his parents went to. Um, during the Depression years, Joseph's father had to work in New York to make a living by commuting, and sometimes he stayed in the city. When he was in the city, he would attend the First Baptist Church at 79th and Broadway. Pastor I.M. Haldeman was a strong dispensationalist and a follow, follower of Darby and Schofield. The message preached by Haldeman was that there was hope left in the world, the Church of Jesus Christ had failed, and that return of Christ was imminent. Christians were to withdraw from all activities in society, such as local schools and politics, since Jesus was coming back any time. The general teaching was to leave the world to the devil and his crowd. When Jesus came back, he would smash the world system. The father would bring home booklets written by Haldeman, and young Joseph would take these with him to school and read them during study time. Joseph states that he was raised in a Baptist five don'ts fundamentalist home with no other teaching on wholesome activities to do instead. This would be the logical outcome of a theology that viewed the world with pessimism. The only thing to do was to survive and wait for Jesus to come back, despite all the negative teaching. Wait a second here. So, being pessimistic about the condition of the world, understanding that evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. You know, to quote scripture, the Bible doesn't say things get better. It says it gets worse. And Jesus Christ does put an end to the world system. And this is somehow bad and evil and terrible. And poor little Joseph Canfield was, was exposed to this negative teaching. Oh, isn't that just so horrible? And of course, he grows up to hate C.I. Schofield as a result. And he comes out and he digs up all this dirt about C.I. Schofield and his lost life and everything. And then he's coming up with all these conspiracies. And, you know, the guy, is a, he's a Jew-hating preterist, amillennial, amillennialist, you know, and he's, he's quoting in things, oh, we're gonna, I'm going to show you, he's quoting Anglicans and things like this, you know, he's Presbyterian, member of Christian Missionary Alliance, churches, you know, this Joseph Canfield, hates C.I. Schofield, but he wouldn't have an agenda or anything, no, nothing like that, sure, but uh, down here it says, over the years, Joseph has attended a number of Baptist and Presbyterian churches. During three years when he lived in Chicago, he attended A.W. Tozer's church, who was a member of Christian Missionary Alliance. Uh, I did a whole study on that, Christian Missionary Alliance. Uh, they Basically, they allow Bible buildings to get built up into huge money, and then they come in and sell them to other people, make lots of money. CMA is a totally corrupt, wicked organization. But uh, why did Mr. Canfield write a book about Schofield? Many people want to know, why would a layman attempt to research the background of a well-known Christian leader like Schofield, write a well-documented book that would hold up to any kind of scrutiny, knowing that the wrath of the dispensationalists would come down hard on him? Oh, watch out for the wrath of the dispensationalists. Yes, we're so so violent, you know. And you can read the, the thing here, but it goes down in. Furthermore, Mr. Canfield wrote the following, The Rapture Cult. Those of us who believe in the pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away the rapture, pre-tribulation rapture as many people call it, we are a cult. Nice. Uh, reacted somewhat less foolishly to World War II than it did to World War I. I soon realized that Daniel chapter 2 could not be used to define the events of those horrible years, but most rapturists seem to follow the party line. I did not join in the enthusiasms of 1948, and I saw, and I soon outgrew that miasma. What's the 1948 thing? The rebirth of Israel. And you look at some of the guy's writings and things, he's anti-Semitic. Hates the Jewish people. And so this is where Tex Mars and Andersnake go and get their attacks on C.I. Schofield from this wicked man here. Look at some of the sources that changed his views on dispensationalism. Tregellis uh, worked with Constantine von Tischendorf on the uh, corrupted Alexandrian text, came out with his own corrupt Greek text. Bishop Frank Houghton, an Anglican bishop, you know, down here he talks about Darbyite, Darbyite excesses, you know, the moral implication of dispensationalism were negative. 
The intent of all this is to show that the rapture cult does not really produce understanding nor real incentive for Christian living on the highest plane, either individually nor social under the conditions of the present day. It creates a distorted vision of the future of the church, absolutely no future, and hopelessness for mankind. <laughs> and that's what we believe is as premillennial pre-tribulation rapture people. No hope for the church. Yeah. Check this one out. Down here it says, As a former and converted ex-dispensational teacher said to me, when we reestablish contact after many years, thank the Lord you have been delivered from dispensational premillennialism. The Lord be praised. And this is the guy that wrote the book against Schofield. And, you know, Tex Mars and these other people get their attacks on Schofield from this loser. Incredible. But check this out. Another little attack that this guy does just shows his ignorance. The Bible version that bears his name, Schofield in other words, is a tainted version produced by two British clergymen, Westcott and Hort. Introduction to the 1945 Schofield Bible edition. Look at my little note I have written here. Schofield died in 1921. C.I. Schofield never endorsed anything but the King James Bible. Okay, when the Westcott and Hort, you know, version came out, uh, Years and years and years later, 1945, they made the new Schofield edition and things. And this knucklehead is blaming Schofield for that. It came out in 1945, but Schofield died in 1921. But somehow, Schofield was for it being put on the new version. So guys, guy's crazy. This, uh, you know, this guy here, it's just insane. But uh, down here, it talks about this uh, Jewish man, you know, this Jewish guy that was a friend of C.I. Schofield. Oh, oh, Christians, you know, we should never befriend Jews. That's that's evil. You know. Therefore, Untermeyer made sure that Schofield presented a teaching in which Jesus was coming back shortly, but also that the Jews were to have their land restored to them. That's what the Bible teaches. This was the birth of Christian Zionism, which today is dominating the Christian churches in Western Europe and uh, North America. 1948 Christians in the West fell like ripe plums for the propaganda that God was opening the door for a Jewish state. He did. Matthew chapter 24 predicts it. Okay. Moses and Elijah in the time of Jacob's trouble are over in the streets of Jerusalem preaching to the Jewish people, doing signs and wonders for the Jewish people. The entire book of Revelation, for it to, be, for it to come to pass, the nation of Israel has to be there. But see, this guy, Joseph Canfield, the Tex Mars will quote, this loser right here, he is a preterist. So the book of Revelation is just poetic. It just kind of happened in the first century, you know, right around there. And it all was over by 70 AD. And now we're in the millennial kingdom. Uh, you know, even though the millennial kingdom has been around almost 2,000 years, so it's not really the millennial kingdom. It's it's just the kingdom on earth. And, and we have Christ here ruling and reigning on earth in the form of the Pope, you know. That's what the Catholics believe. That's what they teach. And that's what this knucklehead right here teaches. That's what you're getting from Anderson. Catholic, Roman Catholic lies. Stay tuned for more uh, uh, Marching to Zion exposed videos that they'll be coming out, you know, as the Lord gives me time to do these things.